Und es, und es ist ein großes Vergnügen, euch zu berichten, im Namen von der Toronto UJA Komitee für Jiddisch. Wir sind sehr zufrieden zu haben als der größten Freudenheit. Mein Name ist Vivian Felsen und auf behalf of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here today. And we're very happy to have a large audience from many different parts of the world. Today's program would not have been possible without our partner, the California Institute for Yiddish Language and Culture, the California Institute for Yiddish Kultur und Sprache, known as the Cycle. I would also like to thank our co-sponsor, the Allweltliche Yiddische Kultur Congress, the Con Congress for Jewish Culture. Unser heutigen Programm wird sein meistens auf Englisch, aber die Yiddische Sprache wird spielen die Hauptrolle in die Meise wegen Haber Rosenfarb, a weltberühmte Yiddische Schreiberin und ihr Tochter und ihr Übersetzerin, Professor Goldie Morgenthaler. As I just mentioned in Yiddish, although our program today will be mostly in English, the Yiddish language itself will be the central character in the remarkable mother-daughter drama which is about to unfold. There will be time for Q&A after the interview. Ihr mög stellen Fragen oder auf Englisch oder auf Yiddish. We are extremely grateful to have Sharon Power our, our, from our Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, who, as always, is running our webinar behind the scenes. Sharon, a herzlichen Dank. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone to please visit our website, committeeforyiddish.com, for Yiddish classes and more. The new semester for our Yiddish classes which was supposed to have started today, will begin next Sunday on October 3rd. And it's not too late to enroll. And now I'm going to um, introduce our two important guests, Goldie Morgenthaler and Miri Corral. So I'm going to start with my friend Goldie. She is a professor of English at the University of Lethbridge, where she teaches 19th century British and American literature, as well as modern Jewish literature. She is the translator from Yiddish to English of much of Haber Rosenfarb's work, and that is her mother, which um, began with the Rosenfarb's seminal novel, The Tree of Life about a trilogy of life in the Lodge Ghetto. But she went on to translate many others, which you're going to hear about in, in the interview, but she has also translated several stories by Yiddish writer Yudlama Peretz into English. And she is a former language columnist for the Montreal Gazette, as well as the author of a book on Dickens and heredity, and of numerous articles on Victorian literature, including one on the translation of Dickens into Yiddish. And, and now I'm going to present um, our very talented interview, interviewer, the founder and CEO of Cycle, Miri Koral. Miri is also a Yiddish poet and translator who among her various other accomplishments, teaches Yiddish language and culture at several institutions, including UCLA, the New York Arbiter Ring, the Workman Circle or the Worker Circle, as they now call themselves, and the Evo. So now without any further ado, I will I'm going to present to you Miri. First of all, I want to thank the uh, Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish for hosting this program. And it is definitely my, to my great delight, I finally have a chance 
to uh, interview uh, in, a, in a public way, um, Goldie Morgenthaler. We have been trying to have uh, you present for the California Yiddish Institute for many years. Uh, and things have always interfered. Uh, the main thing recently, the pandemic. <laughs> So you, you, you're not here in Los Angeles in person, but how wonderful that we can uh, have this program happen in, in this manner and have people attend from uh, all over, all over the country. And, and with this program, we are uniting really three organizations uh, in, in various parts of North America, uh, with LA and Toronto and New York with the Cultural Congress. Uh, which is uh, an, an incredible, uh, you know, is an, kind of uh, endemic for the world of Yiddish. So, uh, and, and I want to say right away in advance that you might hear from my co-host, <laughs> uh, my, my co-host who is uh, a, a hintala, a little puppy. <laughs> Uh, so please forgive us if you hear uh, him wanting to make a comment. <laughs> um, so Goldie, um, this this interview comes really at I think a kind of a crucial time in in terms of what's happening in the Yiddish world, and that is that we are now in the process of losing the the last remaining holdouts, yeah, the Holocaust survivors, uh, the folks that were born and raised in a Yiddish secular world, uh, whether in Eastern Europe or in America or in Mexico City or, you know, Buenos Aires, wherever it was. Um, so you were now talking about the next generation uh, which includes you and me, really, uh, and as the keepers of this legacy. Uh, and uh, more than the keepers, because we don't want to just hold it to ourselves, right? Uh, but the disseminators of this legacy. And this, of course, has been an enormous part of, of your life for, for many, many years. And um, and this is what we want to try to get at today, you know, what, what, what that means for you, how that has been for you. But before we go there, I think we maybe need to hear a little bit about the, this extraordinary woman uh, that was your mother, Chava Rosenfarb. Uh, and so, so maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about her, of Ein Fus, right? And, and, um, Aside from her being your mother, um, what what was it about her work that that was compelling for you uh, to to make it such an important part of your own life, the translation and dissemination? Thank you, Miri, for for that's a lovely introduction, um, and I'm very happy to be here. So my mother was, as as you said, I I think. She, she was born in uh, Lodz, Poland in uh, 1923, and she went through the Holocaust and uh, she was in the ghetto in Lodz, and she was in Auschwitz and uh, at a labor camp in near Hamburg. And then she was liberated by the British army in Bergen-Belsen. After the war, she settled with my father in Canada and she um, basically sat down and started to write. And what she wrote, almost everything she wrote has something to do with the Holocaust is, uh, in one way or the other. So um, she is, to my mind, I think it's fair to say, even though I know she's my mother, I think she is one of the most uh, prominent Yiddish writers of the second half of the 20th century. And she should be, although I, I wish she were better known, uh, she should be one of the most prominent Holocaust uh, novelists because she wrote novels primarily and not uh, memoirs about her experiences. And her great novel, um, her chef d'oeuvre is uh, The Tree of Life, which is a novel in three volumes about the, um, the Lodge ghetto and um, that goes through all the years of the ghetto until its liquidation 
1944. And to my mind, that novel is one of the great masterpieces to come out of the Holocaust. And I really um, find it frustrating, I guess, that, that it's not better known that when I see lists of important Holocaust novels, it's usually missing. Uh, part of the problem may be that it's just a very big book and it requires a certain commitment of time to, um, to read it. But I, I think she had a great deal of trouble getting it published in English. In Yiddish, obviously there was no problem, but in English. And so by the time it came out, I, I don't know, maybe the, the problem was that she was um, a woman writer, that she was not as well known, uh, well enough known for, um, for publishers to want to take a chance on her. I know she, uh, she came very close to having it published by the uh, major Canadian publishing house, McClelland and Stewart, and they eventually decided against it, despite the enthusiasm of their leader. And the reason they, they decided against it was because they were afraid that nobody had heard of the author and it was um, too big a book. So um, she also wrote, aside from that, uh, she wrote three novels altogether and a great many stories, essays, um, uh, fietons, uh, travelogues and poetry, several books of poetry. So I think it's fair to say she was very prolific and I, I think a very important writer. Almost everything she wrote was in Yiddish, but towards the end of her life, she started to write in English as well. Um, yes, and I wanted to uh, be able to show this um, just image of one of her first books of, of poetry. Um, Right, uh, which which is as as you can see, the Ballade von Nechtigen Wald, which was published uh, immediately after the war, in 1947. That was her first, right? Am I correct, Goldie? Yes. That was her first collection uh, of poetry. And how old would she have been then? I, I'm sorry, I didn't do the math. <laughs> so she's born in 23, and and this is 47. So what is that? 24. 24, 24, the age of 24, quite, quite uh, an accomplishment, yeah. Um, so, so what, what might not be so known about uh, Chava Rosenfarb is that her English was pretty amazing too, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she herself did some of the translations of, of her works, uh, but, but then you got involved as well, right? You got involved. So, uh, so maybe you can tell us, I mean, it seems like you began being involved with translating her work at a very young age, right? And, and uh, so how did that begin for you? Well, it, it actually began with um, when I was about uh, 13 years old, I had an operation on my back and I was bedridden for quite a long time. And this was back in the time uh, before there was any um, internet or any any way to to distract yourself, there was television and there were books. And I was uh, 13 years old, and uh, you know, there's only so many books you can read at that age, and so much television you can watch. And, and my mother one day came in with the play that she'd just written, *The Bird of the Ghetto*, and it was in Yiddish. And she decided that the best way to keep me from nagging her because I was bored um, and to, she would get something out of it too, was to get me to translate with her that, that play. And the, the problem was that um, my English really, well, first of all, it was the English of a 13 year old, but it was also the English of a 13 year old who basically learned English at school. My, the language of my home was Yiddish. And so um, my English was not all that advanced. And I, I also, um, Canadians at that time, the story I always tell about this, <laughs> this translation is that Canadians used to say A at the end of every sentence at that time. I don't hear it as often now, but it was very common. 
What I didn't know <laughs> at 13 was that that was a Canadianism. It's not really the way English is spoken in the world. So I had every single, the plays about an uprising in the Vilna ghetto in, and, um, it, and it's about partisan fighters. And so I had all the fighters saying um, things like, we need to get the weapons, it's it, eh? <laughs> and it was everything <laughs> edited with eh? So um, that, that's my favorite story to tell about that. But it gives you some sense of how my English really was not up to the job. And quite frankly, my mother's English, she always felt, um, because she learned it as an adult, she always felt that she needed help with the language. And she was very unsure of herself with it. So the fact that she relied on a 13 year old to tell her how to write English, uh, gives some sense of that. Um, that translation uh, was not particularly good. I don't think it ever got, <laughs> saw the light of day after we finished it. Um, and I, I did it again later when I was much, much older. Um, but that was the beginning. Um, and I, for many, many years, I didn't do anything until I was in my mid thirties when um, my mother, after many years of trying, finally got an English publisher in Australia. And the book was going to come out and she was desperate for someone to fix the English because the editor there told her that the English needed a lot of work. And so she begged me again, she almost bribed me, she was gonna pay me. <laughs> and I finally said, okay. And, and so we sat down to work on, on the tree of life together. And that's really when it started. So did the two of you work on the whole thing together or, or yeah. So your mother was involved in that translation, yes. that, that epic, yeah, <laughs> she well, she had done the uh, the original draft herself, and that's what got sent out to publishers. And I suspect that one of the reasons also that um, it it didn't get any takers was because her English was not that good. There are a lot of mistakes, and um, so when the Australian edition was about to be published, I think she had she had gotten enough feedback to know that she needed help with the English. And uh, by that time, I was my English was much improved, and um, I I agreed to do it. And she, so we worked on her first draft, um, and and I would make corrections on the pages. So by this time, you had your own career, right? You're talking about doing that in the th in the thirties when you were in in your thirties, right? So I assume you were you know, not lying on your back in bed anymore, no, <laughs> but, no. but, you know, deep into your own work. So how, how did you make time uh, for this as well? So I was actually a graduate student. So graduate students have um, a bit of leeway with their time. And um, I, I was also making my way very slowly through the program. And, and this slowed me down even more. I was getting my PhD. <laughs> But um, that, that was basically how that worked. So I wasn't really, I didn't have a, a full-time job yet. And uh, it, it allowed me some, um, some time to work with her. So, so just let's go back for a moment to, to your childhood. So when, when you were a, a child. Um, so perhaps we can have your, your mother's perspectives or emotions around motherhood yeah, uh, through her poems, right? That were included in the book that you edited, um, these, this wonderful book, uh, Exile at Last. Uh, uh, so um, you mentioned to me that one of your favorite poems, at least you know, certainly in this collection, is uh, a clay for my kind, yeah, um, uh, a dress for my child, and uh, so I, I'd love to have you read it. We have it in English. We're, we're, we'll have Goldie read it in, in Yiddish, and I'll show you uh, for everyone in the audience the the words in English as she goes along. But before that, uh, um, well. That's okay. You, well, well, tell us though, why, why is it one of your favorite poems? And then we'll go further into it once we all hear it. Um, I think it might be better if I, I, I explain 
afterwards because okay. okay so that people will know what the poem is actually uh saying and, and you can they they can read it in english right yes so just give me one moment and um i'm going to get to it um hopefully okay should i start yes please Ich wollte dir aufgeneigt a Kleid, mein Kind, von Leutere Teulen erfreit, und wollte dein Kopf baziert mit der Hut von zerschmeichelten sonnigen Seid. Ich wollte dir ungetan a paar Pantoffel von dreusendicken, schwebendicken Glas, und wollte dich a gelost von mein Tier mit Buketten von Zusog, von Grün und von Ros. Is aber dreusen as euch kalt, mein Kind, und sleutet euch dir dreusen ein heftiger Wind. Er wird zerpflegen das tulene Kleidel von Freit, wachlappet wird werden dein Hittel von sonniger Seid. Zerspielten werden die Schichlech von dinnigen Glas, in Blotte wird liegen der Zusog von Grün und von Ros. Schon herrlich von Weiten Dein hilflos, dein kindisch Gewein. Mamele, los mich nicht lieber allein. Wollte ich dir aufgeneigt a Kleid, mein Kind, von mein eigenem Tunkeln zar, und dir übergenitsche wird mein Hut von der Erfahrung, zu baschieren dich von der Gefahr. Wollte ich dir ungetan meine eigene Schicht, gekoverte mit Nägel von stechiger Pein und wollt dich erreusgelosen von mein Tier mit der Taschlamp von Kochme von weißen dicken Schein. Ich so bedreusen a so kalt, mein Kind, und sleuert auf dir dreusen a heftiger Wind. Er wird zerfliegen das faldige Kleid von, de, von mein Zar und bläusen dein Busen verpachert Dein Kopf vor Gefahr. Und sinken werden die nägliche Schirch in ein sumpiger Netz. Der Taschlamm vom Kochme wird werden das Eug von Aletz. Schon her ich von Weiden, dein Helflos, dein kindisch Gewein. Mamele, los mich nicht lieber allein. Asaschli Masel dick, neithorn dein Mame. Kenn kein Kleid, nicht gneien vor ihr Kind. Stärkt und stärkt und sie blutigt, bläust ihr eigene Nischomme und ihr Kopf vernarrischt und ihr Eug verblind. O, oh, als was kennt ihr aufneien, aufstechen, mein lichtig golden Kind ist ein leibend Hemdel von Liebschaft. Go nicht mehr, als was kennt ihr mitgeben, is broches in a heise schal von mein Satre. Und losen in dreusen Kind muss ich dich losen allein. Efsche in Hemdlech von Liebe ist leichter zu lernen zu gehen. Sitz ich und stech und ich stech zwischen stubige Wind und flattert in mir das Herz und zittern bei mir die Hand. <laughs> that poem always makes me cry at the at the last verses yeah perhaps dressed in clothing of love you will learn better to go from home how beautiful how beautiful so so of course it's a great translation <laughs> i i have to say it's a great translation so who who translated that, that my poem? mother that's hers hers that i mean Pretty wonderful, but of course, those of you, uh, you know, listening and watching us, you know, the, the sound of the Yiddish, of course, it's a whole, whole other thing. You know, it's a, it's a has a, a whole beauty and and um, ring of of its own. That's that's quite wonderful. So, so, why is this your favorite poem, Goldie? And and what does it what does it tell us about? your relationship with your mother and, and how she felt about being a mother? Um, I, well, the easy answer obviously is it's a poem about me. 
So, um, but that's not really <laughs> so why, that's, <laughs> that's not really why I love it. I, I think what I like about it is, in fact, it's not just about any one child. Um, I think it's about children in general and parents and the fact that parents cannot um, cannot protect their children 100% ever. And eventually the child has to go out on its own. And I guess what I find moving about it, especially in the last verses, is this notion of, um, of acceptance, that this is the way it has to be. So that despite the fact that the mother clearly loves her daughter and would do anything to protect her, there's an acknowledgement that that is impossible and that um, children grow up and um, become their, their own people. And hopeful. the only thing really that parents can hope to give them is, as she says, is love when they're young and um, the parents' own experience and cannot really be totally transmitted. You have to go out there alone. And, and I think I, I always, uh, that's what always breaks me up at the end. Um, I, I think it's quite a beautiful poem from that point of view and, and a, a universal one also. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree. It's really, it is a really beautiful poem. Thank you, thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, and, and I just wanna uh, say, in terms of our formatting today that you are welcome to ask questions. The only thing is that we won't be addressing them until toward the end of this hour. Uh, so please feel free to write them into the Q and A and, and we, will, we will look at them uh, afterwards. Um, so, So other than these these translations that you were sort of in, involved with, right, uh, as a, as a child, and then and then you know later, but but let's say growing up because this is you know now a world which was is verschwinden, right, which is also uh, gone. So what what was the that world like uh, for you? You mentioned that obviously Yiddish was your mamaloshen, your native tongue, as it as it was for me in growing up in New York. Uh, so, in so in Montreal, Canada, right? So, what? How was Yiddish a part of your life aside from the the home the home life? Well, I was sent to um, Montreal had and still has a Jewish school board, and I was sent to one of the schools for elementary school of that board, and it was a secular Zionist school which meant that uh, we weren't, um, it wasn't one of the, uh, the, there were other schools that were much more religious like Talmud Torahs and things like that. But there were two schools in Montreal when I was a child that taught Yiddish and that used it as a very large part of their curriculum. And I was sent to the Volksschule and people's school, Jewish people's school, uh, which was uh, the, the school that I mentioned. And so we had classes in Yiddish, in Hebrew, in English and French. And many of the of my um, mother's, my parents, friends were Holocaust survivors. So they also sent their children to that school. So that was also, I had friends for whom Yiddish was for them as it was for me, a first language. Um, and we, I remember having discussions over the correct pronunciation of English words, and none of us were very sure how to pronounce owl or owl or whatever, things like that. Um, and, and there were other children there whose parents had come on earlier migrations and who were much more um, uh, at, at ease in the English milieu of Montreal. So, um, and, and the Montreal had, in terms of its community, a, a tremendous Yiddish presence, certainly in the 1950s. So there was also the Jewish Public Library in addition to the schools. And my mother was very often invited to speak there. And those uh, talks were, and programs were all in Yiddish too. So um, I really grew up in a Yiddish milieu. But as you, as you suggest, you know, the English was encroaching and later on, French would be encroaching even more. And 
I think that what I experienced as a child is no longer the case um, in Montreal, which is a shame. There is still a Yiddish theater in Montreal. Uh, that was another one of the great um, uh, jewels in the crown of, of Jewish Montreal. Uh, so that still exists, but um, I'm not sure Yiddish is taught anymore in the, um, in the schools to the same extent it was. In fact, I'm sure it's not. So, so it's true that things have moved on and it's sad in a way that that language is, um, it's not gone completely, but it, it is certainly not in as healthy a state as it was when I was a child. Right. But, but uh, on the positive side, at least in my own experience, and maybe your experience, that when people come across works in translation, you know, Yiddish works in translation, it sometimes spurs them to want to read it in the original. Uh, we, you know, we know this from, from uh, wonderful Professor Yoshi Hirose, right, the Japanese professor and many, many others that I've taught over the years who really want to read the Yiddish work in the original. So, so, um, so it's kind of, you know, the translation work is kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? Yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're making it accessible to a lot of people, you're, you're leaving behind the Yiddish, so to speak, but on the other hand, it's a bridge maybe to come back to Yiddish culture and Yiddish language. Uh, so, you know, this is something I, I hope, I hope will also result from, from what you've been doing too. Um, so, how, how, so speaking of that translation, so how does it dovetail with your own academic pursuits? And um, you know your own your own writings, right? Because you know you're you're a writer yourself, and uh, and and are you translating any other works? I, I know Vivian initially met, mentioned uh, a couple of translations, right, from from Parrot's uh, Parrot's stories, I think. But uh, are you doing any other authors? So several questions in there. Okay, so um, I I wouldn't say that when I began my PhD, that I, I deliberately didn't do PhD in Yiddish, although I, I could have. My MA was on a Yiddish writer on Sholomash, which I did with Ruth Weiss at McGill, but I, I didn't want to go there. I, I had fallen in love with Dickens when mm. I was in college, actually, and um, I, I couldn't quite shake the the crush I had on him, I don't know how else to put it. And by the time I, I came around to writing my PhD, I had read pretty much all of Dickens twice over. So it seemed like a natural thing for me to go into, um, to do a PhD on Dickens and on Victorian literature. And uh, in the end, that I, the job that I eventually got at the University of Lethbridge was in fact to teach 19th century literature. So that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past 20 odd years. Um, and I've written articles on uh, mostly on Dickens, but also on other writers. My other favorite writer is Jane Austen from that period. So um, I, I, uh, I wouldn't say that the two dovetail and I think I did that <laughs> deliberately. I really, I wanted to get away from, from the past. I wanted to get away from the 20th century altogether. I went to the 19th. I mean, there was such, so, you know, I grew up with the Holocaust stories of the Holocaust constantly going on in my house. And I really wanted a break. I wanted to go to a period like Victorian England that was calm. It was seemed on the surface at least quiet and um, and had great literature. So those two things appealed to me and um, that has been my academic work. The one time I crossed over was when I wrote an article on the translations of Dickens into Yiddish, which was very interesting to research and um, I, I really enjoyed doing that. But, but in general, the two have been um, 
to have been separate in my life. At the same time, it's also true that while I was working and writing essays on um, the Victorians, I was also translating my, my mother's work. Um, when I had time, the problem was I didn't often have time and I had to give priority to the Victorian stuff. But um, so uh, I was really doing uh, both and, and I worked, I, I would always say when I had to uh, justify my existence at the university that I, I work in two areas um, and those were the two. So, and I've forgotten the second part of the question. Uh, well, if you, if you translate uh, any other Yiddish authors. Oh, so when I was um, still uh, um, doing my, I, I forget, uh, my MA or my PhD, I was taking a class with Ruth Weiss and she asked me if I would translate parrots. For, uh, she gave me four stories to translate because she was coming out with a volume of translated stories by him. And I think she knew I'd fallen in love with parrots. She gave a class on parrots um, once and I just loved him. And I couldn't stop talking about him to her. So I think she thought I, that I would be a good fit for that. And those four stories got published in her book. So do you have an inclination to translate other uh, authors? But, but we're gonna get to the question about if there's more to translate of your mother's, right, at, at this stage. But all right, well, it's on the table, so why don't we ask it now? Uh, what, what is there it? more to translate of your mother's works that, you're, that you have in, in mind? Well, the novel I'm translating now is pretty much the last of her major works. Um, and the what I am finding as I go through her papers are essays that could still be translated um, I, that I didn't translate for the um, Confessions, the book of her essays. Uh, there's one on Sotskever, there's one on Melech Ravitch. Uh, there's one, um, I haven't, I think a long one on Ruchel Korn. So I haven't really gone through those. Uh, so there are bits and pieces. The other thing I discovered I, I, that shocked me um, as I was going through her papers was I found translations that she did from English into Yiddish of major Canadian English writers, uh, Jewish writers, two women, in fact, two of her friends who are both very well known in Canada. One was Adele Wiseman and the other is a woman called Miriam Waddington. And I think Canadians, uh, if they're listening, will know who those women are. They're very, very well known. Why my mother decided to translate them into Yiddish I, I have no idea. There's no in, indication in the archive. I suspect she was going to submit them to the Golden Kite, but um, that, that's the best I can do as to her motivation, except that these two women were her friends. Ah, well, that could be a motivation there. But yeah. So approximately yeah. when, do you know, like when, when was she doing those translations? What uh, decade? Well, I imagine when both of the women were alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't have, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know exactly when they died. I think Adele Wiseman died in the 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. And Miriam Waddington, I, I really don't remember. You know, so some people in the audience may not be aware that, uh, you know, so many works from other languages were translated into Yiddish. Uh, this was a, a enormous part of Yiddish literature with these with these translations, uh, you know, including Dickens, uh, um, you know, including every every major author you can think of. One of my cherished volumes is is a is a book of poetry by the Nobel laureate Rabindra, Rabindranath Tagore in Yiddish, oh you know, from uh, you know Indian uh, from you know his his language. Uh, to uh, Hindi, whatever, I can't remember exactly what he wrote in, but from his language, probably into English, probably into, into Yiddish. But still, this was, um, you know, Jules Verne, you know, every, so many were translated. So perhaps it's not that surprising that your, your mother was continuing this, this yeah. tradition, um, even as Yiddish readers were dwindling, the number of Yiddish readers were dwindling, right? Um, so th this this brings us to um, the the um, 
the fact that she wrote a lot about the Holocaust. And, and I, you know, I, I totally, totally understand your, your desire to get away from that heaviness, you know, that's, that, that was there from, from the lived experience and then, and then the translating experience. So, um, so, so before, before we hear, um, I hope a little excerpt from something that you're working on now, um, let me ask you this question. So when, when you were involved in, uh, in translating some of her, her other works, aside from the, the great epic, The Tree of Life, right? Those that had to do with the Holocaust, you know, how was that for you? What, what, what was that experience like for you and still is, right, in this next work that you're going to tell us about? Um, well, I, I, I'm not sure how you mean how, what it was like for me. Well, emotionally, or was it difficult because you're, oh, you know, you're reading about a lot of, even though it may be a novel form, you know that this is lived experience of your mother's and, you know, and so forth. I, I think it never occurred to me that she was really, she's writing about herself, but in the broadest sense. And so the short stories, for instance, are um, certainly the characters based on her, but um, it's also not her, right? So, so in, in that sense, and the short stories are actually not so much about the Holocaust, but after, about the afterlife of Holocaust survivors in Canada primarily. So that, I, I can't say that I've had a hard time with that. Um, really, the, the, the major problem has been that the, the, when I was working on the short stories, and even when I was putting together, I think, uh, Exile at Last, I had her around to mm -hmm. ask if I got stuck, you know, if, if I didn't understand something. So the short stories are primarily my translation. She didn't do them. But, but if I, I didn't understand something or whatever, she was around to be asked, and now she's not. And, and that is a big hole for me. Um, that is a, um, it's not an insurmountable problem, but it, it can be a problem. And I'm constantly sending out uh, requests on Facebook, like, does anyone know what this means or what this, because she uses a lot of words, uh, I guess, uh, loan words from Polish, from uh, other languages, or even sometimes a Yiddish word that I cannot find anywhere in a dictionary because she was very, um, she knew a large dialect as well. And sometimes there's some peculiar words that creep in, names of soups, things like that. So um, it helps to have friends who have friends who can ask. But um, in earlier times, I would just have asked her. So that feels like, like a loss, frankly. Yeah. Well, before we run out of uh, time, I mean, I, ha I have more questions. I hope we can get to them. But, but so what? What are you? What are you working on now, Baldi? So I'm working on my mother's last novel, and this is called Letters to Abrasha, and it's um, it's a novel that uh, deals finally the Tree of Life ended with the liquidation of the Lodge Ghetto. But it didn't go to the next step, which is most of the people who were deported in that novel. What is not said is where did they go? Where are they deported to? And the answer obviously is most of them are deported to Auschwitz. And what happens at Auschwitz, I think, is, is people know. So um, my mother, I think when she was writing The Tree of Life, she was still quite recently come to Canada and the experiences we're still fairly um, new uh, in, her, in her memory. She couldn't bring herself to describe the concentration camps or her experiences there. So she, uh, Letters to Abrasha is a later novel. And, um, and so, so she didn't, in, in that novel, she really does not hold back. But at the same time, I don't wanna give the impression that this is a Holocaust novel. It begins in a DP camp in Bergen-Belsen, 
uh, where the heroine, uh, the main character has just discovered that her friend uh, from Lodge has survived the war. And his name is Abrasha. And she starts to write letters to him. And the rest of the novel goes back to the story of Lodge before, um, just after the First World War and continues with the life of the heroine um, until uh, finally uh, we get to the war. So the war actually takes up much less space in that novel than it did in, in mm. um, The Tree of Life. Mm. And it does, uh, there are parts of that book that are quite harrowing. Um, I'm, I'm actually at, at those right now and, and I've slowed down working on it because I find it <clears throat> hard to go there. But mo the, major the majority- When did she of publish this? When did she publish it? So she published it in Yiddish in 1992, I believe, but it's never been published in English, obviously. And she was, um, I also have a, lot, a load of guilt about it because she was cons by, by the time uh, she was constantly begging me to help her with the translation. And I was too busy. You know, and this was, uh, she had come to live with me in Lethbridge and she would, every morning, she would ask me if I would have time to work on it. I never had time. I just, anyone who's an academic knows there's always something, there's students, there's this, there's that. I never had the time and I always felt very guilty. And then she died and I, I didn't do it. So I'm determined to finish it now. Um, and, uh, but the section I'm on, even though I'm on leave now and I have time to work on it, I have slowed down because it's, it's hard going emotionally. I can only imagine. Well, will you share a little piece with us that maybe not the most harrowing parts, but, no. but something, something you selected uh, that gives, gives us a sense of, of this, of this, of this uh, I'm sure wonderful work. And is this also a big tome like uh, Tree of Life? Is this? It's not as big. It's one volume. Mm -hmm. It's a large volume. My mother never yeah. wrote short, but it's it's just the one, right? It's not two volumes. So yes, I'm going to read a section that I've labeled Binelli gives birth, and it's about uh, the mother of the main character. Uh, the main character is a second daughter of this family that's based on my mother's family. And uh, they were very, they were very committed Bundists, they were socialists. And uh, the mother is a factory worker, they're extremely poor uh, family. And so the mother is a factory worker and I think the rest will be self-explanatory. So the winter of 1922-23 is brutally cold with frequent blizzards followed by periods of bitter cold that hold the city in their grip for days on end. The streets are forever wrapped in white fogs of snow and gray gusts of smoke. Binella goes to work as usual. At the factory, she lies to everybody about when she is due to deliver, but then comes a dreary day in February. She is doing her work by the dingy light of the electric bulbs, her mind dulled by the hiss, <clears throat> by the hiss of the transmission belts and the monotonous roar of the machines. She feels a sudden ache in her abdomen, followed by a searing pain. For a moment, she cannot breathe. Soon the ache is gone, but with teeth dug into her lower lip, she awaits its return. When it does return, she feels herself caught in an agony of pain which she can only ease with a muffled moan. The pain returns even more insistently the third time. She can no longer stifle her scream. The contractions arrive with increasing frequency and strength, a commotion as the other women rush to help her. She wants to stand up, but she can't. Although many hands are supporting her, so heavy has she become with her stone hard belly. Going home is out of the question. All she wants to do is sink to the floor and find relief from the spasms that are torturing her body. 
she feels herself being lifted. Two foremen and three other men from the neighboring hall are carrying her down the stairs to the boss's office. The factory roars with the echoes of the upheaval in her body. Her head roars like a factory. Oh, women have such small brains, that's for sure. Their memories are short-lived, like those of cats. They forget <laughs> the horrors of childbirth so quickly, as experiencing them again and again, never warning other ignorant and uninitiated young women of what is in store for them. But not she, not Binella. If she survives this experience, she will remember it and never, Never in her life will she go through this again. Never. Her daughter arrives on a red carpet of blood, born on a heap of material woven at Mr. Moscovich's textile factory, a true proletarian daughter. She takes possession of the world with a powerful howl as befits a daughter of revolutionaries. The baby is lying on Binala's lap. By her side stands her husband, Yaakov. Near the door at the far end of the room stands another man, Binala's boss, Mr. Moscovich, her class enemy and her protector, the man who held her hand during those terrible moments. Tears mixed with perspiration sting her eyes as she sees her husband approach Mr. Moscovich and gratefully shake his hand. Mr. Moscovich, who is still quite a young man, is deeply moved by what has just happened inside his sumptuously furnished business office and by the role he has just played in the drama of birth. He wipes his face with a white pressed handkerchief, breathing heavily as if he were the one who had just brought a child into the world. Binella, still in a daze, beams a smile at him. I will always remember you for the best, Mr. Moscovich, she declares. And that's the end. Wow, that is incredibly evocative. And, and uh, you know, you have everything, including her political leanings <laughs> right. and uh, the, the ideas about women and childbirth is really wonderful, wonderful pastors. Thank you for sharing that with us. Is it, is it a coincidence that the same characters that are in Bochani? No, or, or, or no, it's a continuation, is it? It's a continuation, yeah. yes, that's wow. right. Wow, okay. Um, fantastic. So uh, this, 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 by the way, is um, an English, I say, I actually have a slide of this, um, uh, an English language version of um, uh, uh, one of the, the novels that has been translated uh, in two parts. Right, so um, we're running out of time, but but uh, but just very quickly to mention that, and you mentioned it earlier about Lodge, um, that uh, Lodge figured heavily in in yes. in uh, your mother's writings, and uh, you know it's it's a city that's dear dear to her in many ways, even though the whole Jewish populace was. Wiped out, uh, you know, with with the ghetto and and then the the aftermath of the ghetto, um, but uh, out of it has come a number of books, right? Out of her experience of lodge and recreating the the lodge um, between the between the wars, basically, uh, and and so this the book Bochani was uh, published in English in two volumes. And uh, one of which is called Of Lodge and Love, right? And, 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 I, and I just, I just want to say before we go to q &A that, that that the last part, the epilogue in that book, which takes you on a, a, a galloping journey through, through Jewish history, from the beginning to, you know, to let's say po post-war time, mid, mid 20th century is extraordinary. It's just extraordinary uh, evoking, evoking you know, the generations and the, the, 
um, the ancestors and all of, all of the, the events. Uh, I mean, even if you do nothing else, you young people listening to this, uh, read that, la that epilogue um, because it, it's a beautiful crystallization of, of the highlights anyway of Jewish history, which is so complex and beautiful. And, and that, you, you know, your mother, of course, put a enormous magnifying glass on one particular aspect of it, which was, you know, life, life in a, a shtetl before the war, in Lodz, uh, leading up to the war, uh, and then, you know, the ghetto, and then, you know, the immediate aftermath of the people that were survived and, and dispersed. So, um, before we go to Q&A, is there something that you would like to add, Goldie, to, to our discussion to help wrap it up? <laughs> no, <laughs> except that I hope that people will read my mother's work, um, all of them. The um, Confessions are is the most recent book that's come out. These short stories are out of print, I'm sorry to say, and I would love to have to get them reprinted, but I haven't had luck so far. Um, but anything, really anything. And if you have the patience and the time, do read The Tree of Life. I've had those people who have read it, um, including one of the great Dickens scholars, to my great surprise and delight, sent me, he, he sent me a wonderful email that he was in the middle of reading it. He's not Jewish and he has no connection to anything Jewish. And I was so impressed by how well he understood it. So I, I really um, hope that people will continue to read my mother's work in English, obviously, if not, if not in Yiddish. Uh, yeah, I just wanna show, uh, share with you all just a, a few quick slides before we go to the Q&A. Um, hold on a moment, I need to share my screen. Um, so, um, you know, uh, so this is, this is, this is your, your mom, uh, with her mother and sister right after the war, right after the war, right? This is late 1945, maybe early 46. Uh, she's there on, on the right and, um, you know, um, uh, and, and with, with, Po po poems in her purse, basically, right, which she's about to publish. Uh, we, and this was the book, and this is a couple of, of images which I mentioned before of of the the you know, two major works that have been translated into uh, English, and and the Tree of Life, thanks to Goldie, is now available to us in English. And um, this is this is uh, Chava revisiting Lodge right after the war with her friend. Uh, this is uh, Chava and a very young Goldie, uh, maybe a, a summer summer time, uh, maybe in the Laurentians or something like yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And this is, this is the book that I flashed earlier, uh, which is a wonderful collection of, of poetry of Chava Rosenfarb, which is then edited. Okay, so let me get out of this and um, um, let's look uh, at some of the, uh, the questions we have. Okay, so this question comes from uh, Robert uh, Shapiro and he asks, uh, Chava Rosenfarb was also fluent in Polish and German in addition to her native Yiddish, absolutely. In fact, most Jews knew many, many languages, not, not just a native Yiddish. Uh, did she write primarily from her memories of Lodge events or did she also read various published works of documents and other primary sources to supplement her memories? Good, good question. Um, yes, she, she did a lot of research and certainly for the Tree of Life. Um, I remember her asking people uh, whether this detail or that detail was accurate. Um, and she read pretty much everything she could lay her hands on. There was in Yiddish, in Polish, everything that was written about the ghetto uh, up to the date that when she was uh, writing the novel. So, so yes, she didn't just rely on her memory. 
And, and here we have another really uh, excellent question from Leslie Simpson. Um, so she mentions that in her new book, People Love Dead Jews, uh, Dara Horn talks about Chava Rosenfarb's Tree of Life as a piece of literature that should be more widely read for its illumination of how Jews lived, in capital letters, lived, for its portrayal of morally complex characters as opposed to myth myth mythologizing uh, the death machine and how Jews died. Yes, exactly. I've made that point myself many times. Uh, too much about how Jews died and not enough about how they lived. Um, I wanted to know, was this uh, an issue that Chava herself talked about? The issue of literature about the Holocaust exploring how Jews lived compared to how they died? If she did, I, it, I don't remember. I don't remember that this was a, an issue that came up um, between us. Um, I, I don't think so. And I, I wonder if this issue about Jews dying and a kind of mythologizing of the Holocaust isn't the function of our period in time now. Um, because for my mother, for her sister, for all the Holocaust survivors, it was obvious that Jews lived, right? These are the survivors. So there's, they were still living. I think it wasn't, uh, this was not, I don't remember this coming up as an issue. And, and also, I don't remember reading about it as an issue until quite recently. So um, I'm, I think it's more, um, it speaks more to our own time perhaps, and, and the notion of the Holocaust, which is certainly receding in history. And, and so what do most people know of the Holocaust? That a lot of Jews died. That's about it. And, and the level of ignorance, quite frankly, is sometimes shocking. So um, I, I, I understand why this is now something that people want to talk about. But for my mother and, and um, my father and, and all the people I knew, I, I don't remember this as, as being something that they um, discussed. Of course, uh, you know, my me memory is fragile and, but I, I personally, I don't. But I think it has been kind of an uphill battle to, to emphasize how Jews lived. And, and we're seeing it in the, the Poland Museum in Warsaw, you know, it's, uh, highlighting centuries of Jewish life in Poland and not about how they died in Poland. Uh, and even the uh, LA Museum of the Holocaust, you know, which has, uh, you know, sections devoted to how Jews lived, you know, before the war. And, but that's, that's a fairly recent development. So yeah. that is a really uh, a good point, but I can see how your, your mom, it wouldn't have been, uh, something maybe that she thought about very much because, because the flood of Holocaust books and movies maybe wasn't upon us yet. <laughs> uh, when, you know, in her, in, her, in her day, when she was yeah, in her heyday. Okay, so here's, here's a question from, um, uh, hold on a moment. I don't know if we can get to them all, but uh, Helen uh, Helen Sayville asked, Goldie, do you think your mother, when writing the poem about you, that she was also thinking of how her own mother couldn't really protect her from what happened to them? Oh, that's a very interesting comment. I, I must say, I didn't think about it, but um, it is possible. My grandmother survived the war. And she survived the war as the mother of two adult daughters. And apparently um, from what I, 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 my grandmother died when I was nine and I don't remember her all that well, but from what I heard from my mother and from my aunt was that our grandmother was in fact, one of these very maternal Jewish mothers who did uh, risk her life sometimes to, to steal food for her daughters. Um, and and she, she tried various ways to help them all uh, survive. And in the end, obviously she was successful. 
but I, it didn't occur to me that that might, it, I, it, it's a very interesting thought. I would have to think a little bit more about it, but um, it, I think it makes sense for mothers in all generations, frankly. Right, yes, yes. You were emphasizing the universal aspect of that yeah. poem, which is of course what makes it so brilliant. You know, yeah, the, the personal that translates to the universal. Uh, we have a question from my wonderful friend, Barbara Bilson. If one doesn't have time or want to read such a massive work as The Tree of Life, um, and uh, and Barbara, Barbara can ask this question. I think she, she's in her mid eighties. <laughs> um, which, which work by Chava would you recommend? Oh, that's tough. Um, I would recommend the short stories. If you can get a... Um, I, there must be copies in libraries that are easily available. In, um, you mean in, in English? In English. In English, uh-huh. Are, are we talking about English or Yiddish? Yes, probably English, uh, yeah. So so that's um, those are short and those are, you don't need to invest that much time. Um, the, the other books that, that are available are the ones Miri mentioned, right, Bochani? Mm -hmm. uh, which is not that long a book. And uh, the sequel is Of Lodge and Love, which is also not, not that big a book. Right, beautiful book, really. Um, a question from Avi, Avi Lichtenstein. What, what, um, what do you want to see from Chava Rosenberg's fans, the larger Yiddish establishment, or perhaps the literary academic universe to get her name out more. You mean in practical terms? What, what I other? guess. I guess. What? What? What do we? What do we need to do? <laughs> well, well, I I wouldn't mind help with finding a publisher for the for letters to Abrasha, and someone who would be willing to republish the short stories. That would be a, a great boon if if anyone has any ideas. Um, I haven't even started to look. Uh, for publishers. And um, for the rest, uh, just um, buy the books and talk her up every chance you get. I, I don't know how else uh, you get. I, I think writers also live by word of mouth. And today we've got social media. If, if you read something that impresses you, uh, let the world know. I, I don't know. I can't think of another better publicity than that. Uh, um, let's see, some of the questions. Uh, okay, I think we're, we're running out of time except for, yeah, I think we've run out of time, right? So Viv Vivian is back, I guess, to tell us that. Uh, so I'm sorry for those, for those whose, que whose questions we didn't get to. Well, we uh, you could, if there's one other sh question that you think we should answer right now, you could do it. Otherwise, um, I would just um, like to add in um, in connection with the last question about the interest in Poland in Chava's work and the translations that are have been done and are being done of her work, and how and how widely are these translations into Polish disseminated. Are you asking me? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, not as widely as I would like. The uh, the Pauline Museum, I when I was last there, which admittedly was a few years ago, they didn't have the books. And I had to complain to the publisher in Lodge. So in Lodge, they, they are disseminated, but because the publisher is based there and and they have uh, an interest. But I I, I keep asking people if they go to the museum to tell me if they have seen the Polish translations at Pauline. And I, more often than not, I get an answer is no. It, it, it seems to have something to do with internal, it's like a Toronto-Montreal divide, you know, Montreal, like Lodge Warsaw. For some reason, Warsaw thinks that what happens in Lodge is not worth their, um, their attention. That, that was the explanation I got. Whether that or not that's true, I don't know. So I, I think the books could be wider distributed. I know the publisher does the best she can. Um, and but, but I think also the political situation there has been a problem. 
-hmm. It's not that easy to be pro-Jewish <laughs> in nowadays in Poland. And um, among those books is the Tree of Life, the whole trilogy. The whole trilogy. And Bocciani also? No. No. Bocciani, I think uh, they have just brought out of Lodge and Love, mm -hmm. the last part. Because again, it's a Lodge publisher. She's not interested in anything but Lodge. So she brought out the second volume, but not the first in, in Polish. But speaking of translation, one last question was about whether any books have been translated into Hebrew. The Tree of Life, when it, very early on was translated into Hebrew as Etz HaChaim, but I was told that the translation is not very good. And somebody a few years ago got in touch with me to ask permission to do um, another translation, which I gladly gave, and uh, because he told me that the Hebrew was not good. And but then I think that the question he's approached Yad Vashem. I don't know. I think that it's on the back burner because of money. Obviously, it's it's a translators are expensive. So um, so there has been that one translation. Um, of the tree of life, and that's all. Well, I want to thank you both for a fascinating interview. And um, Goldie, your readings were very moving. The, the, thank you. Your Yiddish poem and the, the scene from uh, um, Letters to Abrasha. And Miri, as usual, was a, it was a wonderful <laughs> interview. And um, it, was, it was a pleasure to have you both here today. So thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Coming. We had a pretty big audience here today. So thank you to everybody. Yes, thank you to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Goldie. Thank, thank you, Thank you. Bisbald, yeah? Bisbald, yeah. Bisbald.